the students who can't be here right now because it's on Friday, <laughs> as you have noted. I know. Mm -hmm. But this, this hasn't stopped our 30 or so students who are showing up right now, which gives me hope in humanity, if you ask me. I mean, being here instead of somewhere else on a Friday night. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do think, that, of course, there's, um, there's uh, what you might call it, um, there is and there should be uh, hope for us, the humanities, right? Exactly. <coughs> oh, should I introduce you, by the way, since, <laughs> since I feel like I know you forever, I haven't really introduced you um, to the people who are showing up right now. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our Adicam web webinar series, European Language and, Languages and Culture. Um, research and application center um we have many different talks and today we have a distinguished maria pilar milagros garcia as our speaker she is a quite proactive scholar i know her <laughs> and she's dealing with many things but many things at once um but her main interest i believe is in cultural studies and literature right and um, your research mostly focuses on critical discourse studies if i'm not wrong gender studies and rhetoric and um, she's been to turkey many a time and um, she's even worked at Turkish universities like Boazici and Koch. And um, she's currently working at Groningen University in the Netherlands. And um, I don't know what else to put, if you want to maybe mention it about yourself a little bit. Um, so, yeah, um, my BA, so as you were saying, everyone can hear, still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. So I did start out, so my bachelor's is in English language and literature, and then I have a master's in literature, and my uh, PhD is in rhetoric and professional communication. So I do have um, background in, in different um, fields. But yes, like you said, I do most of my research and also um, teaching interests lay within literature and also cultural uh, studies and at the intersection between those two how both uh, disciplines and fields of study inform uh, one another um, as you very rightfully said uh, i started to focus i've always worked on issues of identity and how people actually express identity um, in their language use so while I was doing my master's in literature, I, I worked mostly with uh, Hispanic minority literatures in the US and how Chicanas um, always code switched between Spanish and uh, English to kind of like, you know, talk about who they were and how they used. I was very interested in understanding how they used both languages under which circumstances, how did they switch and what could motivate those. Um, so, and then I moved on to also understanding how language and discourse as a system, um, how they make meaning um, and how, you know, many times societies create certain preferred meanings through the language and the images they use. So, but because I am a cultural studies person as well, I also study how people resist those imposed identities or those imposed gender roles etc cetera, etc cetera. and after of course living i lived i moved to turkey in 2012 i was working at coach university for four years and then transferred to boazici university to the english language and literature department there and of course <coughs> excuse me while in turkey i uh, became even more interested as a gender studies scholar as well in issues of gender identities, but also um, on gender based violence and not so much so um, in the actual physical violence, but more so in uh, how violence may be perpetuated and perpetrated via language and or images as well in what's known as cultural violence. And part of that is what I would like to uh, talk about today. So without further ado, I think I actually talked a lot about myself and I didn't really need to talk so much about it. Um, so let me make sure that this is, yes. So it's now set to full screen. Can you see the screen? Yeah, here we okay, go. Perfect. So today I would like to talk a little bit about 
um, a research line slash project I started out in 2018, then placed in a little bit of a hiatus because another project kicked in. Uh, but th this is something that's very close to uh, my heart. And so, of course, I would like to um, go back to it uh, soon. So the title of this uh, lecture is called Turkish Women in Refrigerators, Gender Roles and Gender-Based Violence in Comic Books and Graphic Novels. Uh, the reason for this particular title, so Women in Refrigerators, is an article by Gail Simone. Uh, in that article that I used while I was actually a coach, I taught a course on uh, the rhetoric of popular culture. So we examined uh, comic books and video games, and she actually discusses how in the world of comic books, there are very few female protagonists, and the, the few that do exist suffer horrendous violence at the hands of men. Um, so I decided to adapt that particular title, Women in Refrigerators, and then adapt it to Turkish Women in Refrigerators, which actually uh, deals with that particular idea. Uh, this is the original one. Uh, I don't know if you can actually read the, the comic strip um, here is the woman is in the refrigerator. So this is what I was referring to. Um, so the reason why I wanted to start by talking a little bit about why comic books, why this particular genre, but also uh, how that fits in a little bit with um, who I am. So as you probably know by now, English studies as a discipline has expanded its scope of research to include materials other than classical literary text. So in those open spaces, scholars like me, who are a little bit in the, who are interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary, um, teach literature as a way to both help students connect to the past, understand the past, and where we've come from, but also to create safe spaces in the classroom where students can discuss issues that are more current and also of relevance uh, as a way to connect to the present and to the future. So because I wanted to combine both transgressive texts and social issues of relevance, I did start this research line, as I told you, back in 2018. Now, may, some of you may remember that on April 10th, 2018, Imran Kamdemir was murdered. Um, the police immediately apprehended her ex-husband, a police officer, as a suspect. Imran was a student at the MA program in English Literature at Pamukkale University. And upon hearing of her brutal murder, a symposium to commemorate her and to discuss gender-based violence in literature was organized. I did send a proposal to that particular symposium um, that focused on a multimedia, uh, multimodal medium, sorry, comic books and graphic novels, as an attempt to blur disciplinary understandings of text, but also as a way to connect to this present and future by discussing uh, issues of social importance. The reason why I chose a graphic novel is because according to scholars such as Knowles, Peacock and Earl, quoting, a graphic novel has the potential to reshape what literature means, transforming the notes a cutting across and moving beyond received ideas of what constitutes a literary text. Seen in this way, this graphic novel is a trans form of literature, end quote. Based on the transforming potential of comic books and graphic novels, what today I want to do is to encourage their interpretation, their incorporation, sorry, in the classrooms, because they can help create a safe and critical environment to discuss various societal issues while they're still, while students are still learning about literature and about theories uh, of liter literary theories. So comic books as a genre dates back from to the 19th century, and it has developed into a cultural phenomenon in the 20th century. They were originally written by young, for youngsters, but are mostly consuming, consumed by males nowadays. 
as I was telling you before, very few female heroes ever make it to the forefront, and even fewer comic book female comic book writers exist. So, as I said before, on top of how you know the very very few participation of women, the few women who do make it to this particular um, medium suffer horrendous deaths. So as you can see here, there's a few examples. Uh, all of Savage Dragon's girlfriends are dead. Amethyst is blinded. Um, apparition, one of her three bodies is dead. The Her soul's bound to her boyfriend, Aqua Girl, dead, bad girl, paralyzed, bad woman, dead, Miss Marvel, mind control, impregnated by Ray, powers and memories stolen, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a full list of these characters. You may access it at that particular website if you are um, interested. So these are over a hundred female comic book heroes that suffer atrocious deaths or other horrendous destinies. So um, because comic books, of course, are considered a medium primarily for entertainment purposes and vastly read by male youth, investigating whether gender-based violence is also alarmingly present in comic books in Turkey is an issue that I thought was worth exploring. Furthermore, investigating the effects of utilizing humor to delve into such a grave problem, such as gender-based violence, is also worth researching because, of course, we need to wonder whether human humor can actually help sensitize people about serious issues. So, as a result, in an era where many scholars, not only cultural studies, but also literature, gender studies, are examining the dynamics of gender equality and many other issues, it does become of importance to understand whether these very small presence of female comic book heroes um, is also an issue in Turkey. So in order to understand that, what I did was I looked up the word Kadın in this Tim Karikatürler, um, and there was a series of uh, comic books that popped up. And fortunately, I've tried to access it again because I wanted to show you, but that's not um, available anymore. However, I do have, for my original research, some of the examples. Uh, as you can see, you know, the dates range because I did up until the end of 2018. So this is what uh, came up. These are a few of the images. So this one, you can see this one here is talking about women and justice. This one, Bayan Yana. And or this one. So in these examples I've just shown you, there are a few common patterns um, that describe women around beauty, womanhood, and under other gender roles. However, of course, the parameters were too wide, so I had many, many uh, results. And uh, of course, the, the reason why there were so many results is because, as you know, um, a Turkey comic books in Turkey have a and comic strips, I should say, and cartoons have a very long trajectory in Turkey. In fact, the first female uh, professional female cartoonist was Selma Emidolu, uh, who was born in 1928 and published her first cartoon in 1943 in Güler, and then began drawing regularly for Doan Kardeş shortly after that. So because of the long tradition of comic books, which has already been discussed also as a transgressive genre, the research scope was narrowed down to only female writers and then trying to understand how they interpret women's lives. So, for example, um, according to an article that was published in Bianet, Türkiye'de Kadın Karikatür Cüdelince, 
these are a few of the examples um, of uh, female cartoonists. So, for example, the very first one, an Ottoman magazine, Leilac. And then, as I just told you, Emil Odu, who started writing, um, drawing in the 1940s. Then between the 1950s and 1970s, we have female uh, cartoonists such as Selma Gündüz, Meral Simer, etc., etc. And then in 72, Gürgül was founded <coughs> and in the uh, decade of the 80s, uh, women were allowed to draw in that particular publication. Uh, and then there was some women who broke off from Gürgül and they started uh, publishing in a column titled Biyüksüzlar. And finally, of course, we have another example, which is Feyhan Güver with her Bayer Gülür. So obviously, um, many women have been interviewed, um, female uh, cartoonists, and have been asked, why are there such few women? Um, and then why do they draw about women? So these are some of the answers that I have found. So for example, Güver said that back in the day when she started drawing about in, in cartoons, they were forced to write about women issues because they were women, so they had to write about women issues. Gülay Batur in the 90s said that there are only a few lawyers, hence there are only a few female cartoonists as well. Uh, Piale Madra in 1996 said, women are second class citizens, they're not allowed to speak or even laugh near men, and in such a society, when women try to make others laugh, one can understand the low numbers. And finally, you were later on in 2004 said that women are lost because of the roles that society allows for them. So our first job is to be a mother, a spouse, so we are pressured in the careers that we choose. Um, however, when we go back and we do a preliminary visual analysis and textual analysis of the comic books that have been written by women, um, I couldn't really find markers of physical violence, but they, they do point to linguistic violence, which I will talk a little bit more about in a minute. <laughs> so, again, <clears throat> because of the long history of comic books, almost 100 years, um, I cannot really talk about all female comic books and graphic novel writers within the few minutes that I have. Um, besides, um, in late 2018, I had just submitted a proposal for another uh, a large qualitative study that lasted a year and a half. So I had to place this particular uh, research project on hold. And then by the time I was done with my other research project, I had to leave Turkey as I'm not Turkish. I do not speak the language and I can't really uh, work on this by myself. So I have placed this on hold until I can actually uh, retake. That larger research project will examine how women have historically understood and also perceived women's lives since the 1920s until the 1980s, for example. And I will examine images of womanhood, gender roles, and so on. But for the remainder of this particular lecture, I wanted to focus on a particular graphic novel. Um, a novel titled Dare to Disappoint, Growing Up in Turkey, written, uh, it's a graphic meme, uh, memoir written by Özge Samancı. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, and I will study uh, and I will talk about how uh, the writer portrays women via female characters, both linguistically and via uh, written language, and which roles they embody. <clears throat> so this is a little bit what I'll be doing for the remainder um, of the lecture. So um, to that purpose, and this is what I was telling you at the very beginning about cultural violence, that's what I uh, focus on. So uh, what I will do is I'll identify the roles that female characters embody discursive markers uh, used to describe their lives, and also examine symbolic representations of womanhood. 
I do conduct such an analysis via rhetorical and discourse analysis. Most specifically, I focus on um, aspects of culture, the symbolic sphere of our existence, exemplified by language and art, uh, that can be used to justify or legitimize direct or structural violence. And this was a quotation by Galtung, who coined the um, phrase and the concept of cultural violence. So I examine language and literary discourse from a discursive perspective with a social, cultural and a gender focus to understand how language, discourse and images are used to talk about and to talk to women in order to identify whether violence is perpetrated. And based on the results, then suggestions for utilizing comic books and graphic novels as resources to discuss both literature related concepts and societal issues in the classroom will be recommended. So, as I said before, um, after thinking about this particular project, I examined uh, what kinds of images and how women were represented in comics and, and um, uh, graphic novels. And what I understood was that there were two traditional gender roles. The women were either overtly sexual figures or inferior characters who met tragic and cruel deaths or loss of power, as you saw in the examples I showed you before. After World War II, female characters were not so overtly and exaggeratedly sexualized anymore, but then they became damsels in distress. And then in the 90s, again, women became hypersexualized and still continued to be portrayed as inferior be beings. So because of these unequal power dynamics is that I focus on feminist critical discourse analysis. Also because um, literature, literary tests, texts also help us uncover cultural and cross-cultural codes embedded in discourse. So this is how um, feminist critical discourse analysis helps me. Um, also because there is a um, an attempt to reflect on our practices and reflect on how we can change things and how we can accomplish social uh, change. This is also accomplished via feminist critical discourse analysis. And then it also helps us understand the gendered ways in which power is abused through discourse. And this is Judith Baxter's ideas. So uh, without further ado, I'm now going to talk to you a little bit about what I um, understood after reading and examining this particular graphic novel. Um, so in this particular graphic novel, we witness the growth physical but mostly spiritual of a girl in a society that goes from being quite open-minded to being restrictive slash militaristic in this transformation mindsets are also changed especially because of the new order and new understandings of the world there are also new dynamics the graphic memoir follows the path of a young girl who never quite fit into anybody's patterns, not her societies, but also not even her families. So Özge, our protagonist, starts out the graphic memoir by, by stating, I have found my identity, when she means that she has finally started school, which she has been quite obsessed about for some time, and now she can wear, finally, a uniform. In the end, and after having tried out many identities, Özge realizes she should become a writer. And through that journey of self-discovery, Özge narrates experiences with other mi major and minor characters and also presents various settings and how they influence her. And this is the part where we can use this graphic novel to actually discuss literature and discuss graphic novels as a genre in the classroom. So, of course, uh, in order to understand how language may perpetrate violence, I read the graphic memoir a few times and then took notes. I identify instances in which um, the writer was talking about women's experiences. And then based on my notes, I wrote down a few categories that emerged. 
So I understood that when the writer talked about women, uh, she was referring to gender roles. The theme of violence was also quite important. And then to a much lesser extent, there were also some ideas about womanhood, religion and family. So when it comes to gender roles, um, very early on in the book, we learned that at school, children are actually taught about the different roles and or job opportunities for women in Turkey in the 1980s. Uh, school thus becomes a very crucial setting uh, in which readers become familiar with most of the important categories uh, that I've just mentioned, but also, of course, uh, violence. Yes, so when we look at this, we see that we have government employee, homemaker, self-employed, and artist. Um, and then, of course, she thinks that that's an amazing graph. Um, because she understood that someone's mom was an artist, which she was totally fascinated about. I did not write this, but this comes from page 16 in the graphic novel. So we learned quite early on that um, that for women, you know, this is what's available. Um, it is also, for example, Özge's mom is a, is a housewife, but she's also a sewing teacher. Uh, so she teaches people how to sew. Uh, and then, you know, we also learn in the graphic novel that the mother is also a housewife. She's not feeling well, but she has guests. So she is expected to cook because she is um, the mother after all. Um, according to the father, who's a very liberal man, uh, women should study engineering or medicine, he tells Özge, to prosper and be independent. And the father also insists that women should work because they need to be independent. Özge struggles throughout the novel to find her place. She tries to be a swimmer, a dancer, a theater major, but everyone crushes her dreams by telling her these are hobbies. These are not real jobs. In the end, they tell her women should get married. And she gets really angry and says, I will never marry. And then her teacher tells her, then you will die alone. For men, though, the job opportunities and gender roles are very different. So, for example, the father teaches um, a very technical uh, drawing class versus the mother who teaches sewing, right? And then at some point she understands that this is Turkey and opportunities for men and women are not the same. At school, girls are also taught gender roles very early on. So, for example, Özge, who wants to enact Atatürk, is told you can't be Atatürk, but you can be Atatürk's wife, right? Um, so, boys and girls' uh, book covers are also separated by gender, red and blue, respectively. Um, the school principal has a very clear idea of what men and women should be in the household. So he says that the head of the family union is the man, woman follows him. If she doesn't, she should be taught to obey, he says. Then, of course, Özge goes to study to Boğaziçi University and then realizes that it is an entirely different world, right? Where students were laying on the grass, they were making out, they were playing music, they were together. The same rules did not seem to apply. Uh, in the city. The second largest um, theme that I told you about is violence mm, when it comes to women, so how the writer talks about women and their lives. Um, in the text, we also learn quite early on, on page seven, that Özge lives in Izmir, a very cosmopolitan and secular city, your city. However, with a military coup in 1983, we also learned that Özge's family has to move out to a very dark neighborhood with dark streets. Because of the military coup in the 1980s, readers also witness how the school system participates in children's learning about violence, mostly as perpetrated against Atatürk's values. In fact, at school, students learn about the Turkish Greek history and how Greeks were atrocious. 
The writer does not delve with Kurds and or Armenians. Uh, we only know about Greeks. A very uh, important subcategory within violence is gender-based violence. Um, it is quite clear in the graphic novel that women and girls faced quite a lot of gender-based violence in the 80s and 90s, as you can see in this particular um, um, excerpt. For example, um, we can only see how someone's wearing eye makeup and then, you know, people are laughing about the idea that she may have been, uh, she may have suffered violence. Um, this continues on. She understands that actually there's very little sensitivity and not much education and or knowledge about gender-based violence. Um, one day she shows up with a black eye herself because she's fallen and, and then people start assuming that she's done something and that someone has obviously hit her so then she starts saying yes my boyfriend hit me and then people just say oh poor you uh, at some point uh, she suffers also uh, she's attacked uh, luckily for her she actually survives without much uh, without being harmed but of course this traumatizes her for a long time and what she realizes is that she does not really have a network to discuss this with. So um, the next category uh, that appears is the idea of womanhood. What is a woman? So at the very beginning of the graphic novel, a girl shows with a very girly school uniform and Erzge is very jealous of her, not so much because of the outfit, but because of the fact that she can go to school. If you remember, I told you that at the beginning she was really obsessed with starting school. So then she's always dreaming of both being reunited with her sister, who's older than her and already at school, but also of like being at school and, and learning. But we also learned that the ideal of beauty is a woman who has veins in her cheeks. Um, later on, when she herself goes to school, we are introduced to Özge's teacher, and she describes her as a big but beautiful woman. At school, we also learned that there was a difference between being a woman uh, in the late uh, Ottoman um, Empire uh, versus being a woman now with Ataturk. Uh, sorry, with Ataturk, not now. Um, and then, you know, they're also talking about how it was very different and people behaved differently. And then what happened after uh, being westernized by Ataturk. Uh, the next to last category that I wanted to briefly talk about is religion. These are categories that appeared much less when it comes to when uh, Özge, uh, when the writer is talking about women. Um, so we learn that according to Özge, women like her are perceived as promiscuous, as valueless, uh, according to the boys at school, women are infidel, exhibitionists, and brainwashed, westernized bitches. And Merve, who's a practicing Muslim, is resented because scarves have been banned and she has to wear a hoodie and that she has to remove uh, in the classroom. And the final category when it comes to every time women are mentioned is family. Um, as members of the family, Daughters are described as errant girls, and they're good students, they should not disturb the father. And then the uncle, the man, is a socialist, he's against violence. But uh, the mother is shown as a very understanding person, knows how to make peace, she needs to connect to the father. The father, on the other hand, likes hard work, order, discipline. There's no pleasure for him. He rose or hurt her children. He didn't have a family himself. So he's learning to be a dad through his daughters. So based on this particular analysis I've conducted of uh, Dare to Disappoint, um, some concluding remarks I wanted to end with is that comic books and graphic novels can indeed be used in the classroom. 
um, they can help us understand cultural violence. They can help us understand how um, many times language and images can perpetuate and perpetrate violence. Uh, violence that's more symbolic, but still nonetheless violence. Uh, it can also help us understand how the arts engage with such with topics such as violence. Um, because it is a very uh, complicated problem, it can also open up spaces for students to see themselves represented in some experiences that are narrated in those graphic novels and perhaps even find a network to discuss their own experiences. And then finally, um, they can also help us and they can also, they should be included in the classroom to understand how graphic novels work as a genre. Mind you, this particular uh, graphic novel I just discussed with you um, is indeed was written for a US audience. So it does engage in binaries, women, men, Ottoman times, Ataturk times. And there's not a lot of critique or a lot of nuancing certain problematics. But still, the fact that a graphic novel is not perfect does not mean that we shouldn't include it in the classroom and we should engage with it critically. And I don't know if you have, if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much for that interesting speech. In fact, it made me think, why do we not include comic books more often in our classrooms, right? And um, it has a lot to do with our preconceptions, I guess, I guess with the um, literary canon that was taught to us. And that we have that, again, binary thinking that we have serious literature on one hand and then we have not, not so serious ones. And um, maybe we should be the first pioneers kind of breaking that um, binary thinking, right? Um, any questions, by the way? Um, maybe you can't see the comment section, but if you don't want to speak up, you can always write in the chat section. And I, I can read it out loud for <coughs> speaker to hear. We have to be patient because sometimes it takes time <laughs> for people to really open up. But meanwhile, maybe I can um, comment on a very interesting part of what you just said and how humor has that effect of resilience, of resistance, right? And it has the potential to create an alternative space that where women, not only women perhaps, but all kinds of minorities that feel um powerless in the society to create their own spaces to find their own voices right and humor is a thing that can make us feel quite empowered right so i was thinking about that too um because i mean i don't know if you want me to uh talk a little bit about it yeah or... i do i do yeah, yeah. Exactly. um so yes so for example you know, there's obviously it's it's a controversial. It's not a yes, no kind of answer uh, or even approach one should take to humor, because, of course, uh, we all know how wrongly humor can go. Um, I guess that to me, the most important part is that since it is a woman using humor to talk about it, um, and mind you, I don't mean that only women can discuss gender-based violence, that this is not how I mean it, but at least since it's a more direct and personal uh, approach and take on gender-based violence, in, in that sense, humor could help, right? Um, because it is set in, in a way that it's perhaps not so serious that's not only focusing on statistics but focusing on that idea that I want to create awareness and I want to create um, at least a space where people can talk about it um, and you know when people can talk about it to everyone not only women because obviously men are also part of the problem so they should also be part of the solution and, yeah. part, of the, and part of the discussion right so so yeah in that sense it could help 
And yes, and the idea of using only serious literature, this is something that I've always, I don't know if I'm some sort of like a, a person who tr who fights for the underdog, but yes, I do believe that um, comic books and, and graphic novels have this potential to transform what we think about literature and what we think about serious literature, right? Exactly. And I think it's, it's, what, it's one of the things that makes the students very interested in talks like this, right? It's a, it's a way to form a communicative bridge between generations because humour can also transcend that limit between different generations. Maybe it's a very hard thing to form that kind of um, communication with, with the canonical literature we have because it, it belongs to a different era. But when you have humor, it's right here and right now. But at the same time, it has a potential to kind of call and address those who were before us. Um, so seeing, especially seeing that female cartoonists, um, and I didn't know most of them. I felt very ashamed that um, I called myself a feminist, but I didn't know these women existed. So um, thank you very much for introducing them to us. Um, and I also thought about the thing about how um, in the book in the comic book how we have the greeks but not the kurds and armenians perhaps because the author is from izmir which has again a very interesting stance many people in izmir that i know i am also a descendant of greek immigrants and many people the majority of the people living in Izmir are probably immigrants of um, mainly greek um ascendants so um very interesting to see that kind of discourse used in classrooms um, that are related to history, where you learn about people who are enemies, but then again, your grandmother or your grandparents <laughs> are part of that enemy. So it's very interesting to hear that um, different stance. And I think it's also related to how we view the Western parts of Turkey and the Eastern parts of Turkey. And again, that binary thinking kind of moving into that um, geographical statement and how individuals are products of that statement, right? That the um, main political parties use to kind of categorize us into part, different parts. And also, like I said before, I mean, she wrote this book originally in English. It's not a translation, not even her own translation. I don't even think the book, ex I mean, it could exist in, in Turkish back when uh, when I uh, did this particular, when I started with this particular project, it was in English because she did write it for a US audience, right? So, I mean, they would be familiar with very few things, but I'm, I'm assuming again about people's knowledge, but yeah, for the most part, they may know about uh, the Greek conflicts or however they're phrased in history books, but that's why she glossed, why the writer glossed over most of the things, right? Because this is not a book that's for a Turkish audience. If it were for a Turkish audience, perhaps they would have also, she would have also included um, Kurds and Armenians as part of those history lessons. But yes, in this case, she doesn't. Yeah, There's yeah. never any mention of those uh, two uh, minorities. So why do you think this was written mainly for the US audience when its powerful impact could have been on the Turkish audience, right? Where it was supposed to make the change, where it's supposed to create a difference is here in, in these lands where women can actually make good use of this kind of a narrative. But I understand the political implications, yeah, but um, what, what do you think of that? So I think that, I mean, uh, as far as I remember, uh, the writer does live in the US. So I guess that she wanted to write, uh, an, because it is a, a memoir, um, about herself, right? What it meant growing up and because it was for a US audience. So I don't know why she wouldn't write it about, uh, or why she wouldn't write it and, and then publicize it in, in Turkey. Like I said, I don't know that she hasn't. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, um, I guess that, you know, this idea of perhaps she doesn't really want to um, create consciousness or awareness or societal change. This is me, right? Me as, a, as an educator. I want to use my, my classroom purposely. Um, we all do. But in my case, I do combine that idea of connecting to the past via literature, but also connecting to the present and the future. So I do think that there is 
potential in utilizing comic books and, and graphic novels, right? But again, they're not perfect. So we still have to address and, and approach those uh, particular texts very critically, right? Like we always do with all yeah. literature and all texts. So I do think that there is potential, but this is me as a scholar and as an educator seeing that potential. I don't know what she intended to do with her book, right? Yeah. I do know that she, it was originally published in English and for a US audience, but. Yeah, and you're very right in that this can be multiplied, right? This study has a lot of potential in turning into a quite bigger project, um, maybe in the future. Yeah, but but I, I'm just having a great conversation with you. <laughs> I'm really not the best moderator in the world, I guess. <laughs> I've taken the liberty of asking all the questions myself. Do we have any other questions? Anything that you'd like to add? Any comments? Maybe you've given a lot to think about, right? Food for thought. So um, I'd like to thank you. Um, for this brilliant, brilliant speech and giving us very inspiring thoughts. Um, maybe we can utilize these comic books and graphic novels more in our classrooms um, to at least make justice to this empowering stance of the discourse created alternatively, especially in relation to freedom and the whole potential that it can give us in terms of how to teach our students to become better versions of themselves, both by criticizing and also recreating these discourses. So thank you very much for being us with us today. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Good evening to us, but have a good day to you, I guess, right? Yes. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it is a little bit earlier, but <laughs> yes. Good uh, evening to you all, and thank you for all the students for joining us on this uh, Friday afternoon slash early evening. Um, <laughs> and I wish you a very happy rest of the evening. <laughs> thank you so much in the name of all of them, and hope to see you in the future once again. Hopefully yes. face to face this time. Yes, indeed. Me too. <laughs> see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.